Hey guys, welcome back to Royal Enfield Custom World Live, episode two. Thanks for joining us last week for episode one. And just a reminder, my name is Adrian Sellers, repping the custom program live from lockdown in the UK. And uh, this week, we've got another UK resident, uh, Alec from Old Empire Motorcycles, who will be joining us to talk about his uh, exciting build that uh, we launched as part of our uh, twins introduction way back in 2018. Welcome to the show, Alec. We're going to show can the interceptor. I can, yeah, hear you loud and clear. Indeed. Good to have you on. Um, this show is uh, going to be about um, this bad boy right here. Um, Alex Interceptor from Old Empire Motorcycles. And first, I'd like to talk about uh, Alec, what, what got you into building? Where, how did you start? You know, what, what brought you into the world of uh, custom motorcycles? Uh, it's sort of an odd sort of start into the world of motorcycles in general because um, I think like a lot of people, I was uh, almost pointed away from getting a motorcycle from being young, purely uh, for, on the basis of, uh, I think, my parents' perception of it being dangerous. And uh, so none of my family rode at all. Um, but if anything, it's one of those things that almost drove me further towards it, as these things usually do. When you're told you can't have something, it's the very thing that you want the most. Um, so uh, in, in the end, I think at about, I think 18, I actually got my first um, uh, motorcycle. Um, and then it was around that time, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Orange County, uh, choppers and all of that <laughs> sort of uh, that sort of stuff. Kate was was a was a sort of big then, and uh, I don't know why, but I just it's it's so it seems so cheesy and corny now, but it's like it sold it to me, you know. And um, I, uh, I I then realised maybe this is something I want to have a little look into, and from there really went about, I guess, um, you know, getting the kind of uh, skills necessary to be able to to build what i wanted to build so yeah that's that's kind of a the basics of it i guess that's good to see you've been able to keep a somewhat more peaceful shop than the uh, the boys at occ but uh you only see yeah, the awesome. we don't show the real side of it you, you only we only show you the peaceful side i've got there's rave kicking <laughs> down doors on a regular basis you know what it's like throwing the tools around <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, I see. I think what we got here is a picture of your your first build. I think it was, and I can't help but uh, observe that it appears to be a Royal Enfield. Absolutely. Yeah, it's kind of odd the fact that when we worked with you guys, I think I said when we first started our conversations that it, it, um, that our um, our first build was a Royal Enfield. Um, in fact, our first three builds were Royal Enfields. We'd had plans on building a run of eight um, uh, uh, based around the, uh, I think they call it, I can't remember. It's, it, was the, it was the newer version of the cast iron 500 bullet. Um, so it was uh, with a five speed gearbox rather than the four, um, and, um, but in a very similar um, frame. Uh, and it was it was awesome. It was an awesome little bike. Everybody jumped on it. We absolutely loved it. It was it was um, it was just it was it because it was the only bike at that point that you could buy um, new or very new, but that was almost like buying a bike from the nineteen sixties or seventies in terms of its character uh, and its sound and its soul as such. Um, and we, I loved that, and um, that's why we used the first. So we did the pup, which was uh, a hardtail frame uh, motorcycle, a little bobber. That was a lovely little bike. We built two or three of them, and then the fox, which is the blue one in the in the centre there, the big the bigger photo. That was um, we retained the suspension on it, 
um, but along similar lines. And all were, were fantastic little bikes. And we built, and we did build one EFI, one fuel injector 500 as well. Yeah, very cool. So coming to working on a Royal Enfield wasn't that uh, much of a foreign experience for you. When when you're working on the the twins, did you? I mean, was there a carryover from that? Did you see a a same a, a similar approach in the engineering and so on, or was it a whole new thing for you? Uh, honestly, it was a uh, it was a it was a very different bike to what we were prepared to work on. I think on the basis of our experience working with the older ones, not in necessarily uh, uh, it, it, not not in a in a, in a good way or a bad way in more of a it was just a very it was a, a different a different bike in, in its entirety um and um you know i think i think the older bikes that we worked on you know there was a certain uh you know had its own particular character you know big 500 single versus the the twin um that the interceptor uh is or was and um and i think i think the one thing i did like and maybe we'll we'll come on to that anyway. And, and I've, I've I've spoken to a few people about it. But the one thing I did like in comparison to a lot of the builds that we've done before is that the simplicity of the setup of the for for a for a you know a, a, a modern you know uh, off the off the production line motorcycle um, to be able to customize it to the level um that we have done with some of our other bikes especially concerning electronics i found it so easy to work with you know genuinely easy to work with in comparison to some of the other stuff that we've had to deal with you know that's great to hear i mean talking about some of the other stuff you you've worked on in between that first uh, royal enfield build and, and obviously the the interceptor you've had quite a few builds quite a few exciting bikes out there how how did you find your style and approach change over time, or didn't it? Um, did did you find yourself evolving um, as your your workshop grew and so on, or or is it did it pretty much been a straight line? Uh, everything that started with the pup, and you just continue to do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've I've always kind of flown by the the seat of my underpants, as they say here, in terms of I've just kind of winged it in many respects, um, and so I never really had a had a vague idea of where we were headed but then kind of just went with it as well so in terms of the actual styling of the bikes i think they always had a particular look and feel about them but i think as we went on we learned a lot refined the build process which meant we changed the aesthetics and the ergonomics of the uh, the bikes as well uh, and and you know also if i'm honest i think i i allowed or wanted to um to allow other people to to make some of the components that I couldn't make with the skill set that I had and introduce them. So a lot more like CNC machining, uh, that sort of thing. So, I mean, the pictures you've got there, you've got like, say, the Ripon, which was a, a CB550, like an old sort of uh, 70s, I think, at build, you know, with an underslung shock. We wanted to play around with the suspension on that. And, you know, one of the things we like to do is relace the wheels if we, if we don't like the symmetry of them, but utilize um you know uh, some of the uh, the original lines of the bikes like the tank is actually the original tank from the cb550 just modified same as what we did on the interceptor so you know we had the option to, to ditch the interceptor tank but the fact is is that if you weighed it up with the rest of the frame and engine there's uh, we couldn't really do a lot better you know um we could just you change the paint a few other bits and bobs same for the gypsy which is a cb250 that was a lovely little build again similar kind of process behind that and then the typhoon which is the central one there that was a ducati based project which is our, probably our biggest build to date and was more looks than for riding because it was unbelievably uncomfortable to ride um but it you know it really had some nice lines um and um and most of that was all all, all sort of custom made by ourselves or people that we we knew you know we had a, a chap who specializes in girder Bork, jake robbins he he makes really nice um custom uh, front ends or and and you know uh, uh refurbs uh, original girder forks and springers and all sorts and he did a, a wonderful job of the front um we had a lot of machining work done by uh some friends of ours down the road demeanor customs um yeah we, we i think as we've gone on we're in, involved a lot more all local or uk based craftspeople to just make our bikes that little bit better you know brilliant i think we've already talked a little bit about this bad boy here the uh yield interceptor um 
and what you've done to it uh, in, in actually keeping a lot of the, for me, keeping a lot of the character that, that makes it awesome as a, as a very simple um, classic motorcycle. Um, but then you've, you've tweaked it. You've added the, the old Empire touch. You want to talk a little bit about um, your concept going into it, what you know, what you were thinking uh, when when creating this very sort of stripped down um, aesthetic. Yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I think, I think there's um, for for, in, for instance, when we took when we looked at that Ducati, that Typhoon, the our, our biggest build to date. Um, the the start point to the end point of that, you know, there's considerable difference with what we started with and to what we ended up with um you could you couldn't even probably tell that it was what it was versus what it we turned it into whereas with this what we felt was quite important because at one, at one because you know it was it was the it was one of the first uh, ones available for people to see i think it was important that we wanted people to see what it was and where it had come from so there was certain elements we wanted to make sure that we could keep, keep or we wanted to keep sorry and also there were the elements that we thought were uh were, were that they look we would do hard we'd do hard to improve a huge amount without changing the entire styling of the bike for instance like i said about the tank the tank we you know we played around with putting some other different tanks and stuff on it or making one from scratch and the fact is is that the lines and everything on that but you know on that particular tank are absolutely bang on um uh you know i thought we might have raised up at the back or did something i can't remember um uh i can't remember um the details of it we might have moved it a bit but the, the shape and everything stayed the same we removed, removed the filler cap and made it a flush filler cap but i mean um in terms of the actual overall styling of the bike um i, I don't think we really knew where we were headed we weren't sure whether it was going to be a flat tracker or whether it was going to be a you know more of a cafe i i don't we don't we never really do know when we kind of start off on the process we kind of just let sounds really uh wishy-washy but we kind of let the bike almost take itself off in the direction that we want we kind of hang bits on it you know we we, we sort of hold bits up on it we there's a lot of masking tape inv involved i go through like five rolls of masking tape taping bits on just to see what it looks like you know and then um and then it kind of you know, we take bits off put bits on chop bits off and um and then we end up with kind of you know a, a, a happy medium between something that's going to look fantastic and and also something that's going to function because that was obviously quite a big part of the brief was we wanted to make sure people knew this could be ridden and ridden you know relatively hard as well speaking of the riding aspect uh, something that i think uh, everybody asks about when we take it to shows and we've taken it to quite a few shows over the last couple of years um, and we were looking and we were asking online for, you know, any questions for you. Um, definitely, I mean, the most of them came back. Where are the levers? How do you brake? Uh, how do you change gear? Um, there's, there's nothing there. So, so you tell us a little bit about what's going on there. You know, what a got you, got you thinking about trying to make that area super mm. clean and then be how you actually did it. Mm. It was, I think it was the original, the process was like, uh, let's remove everything and then let's uh let's see what we can do to make it actually usable um so and, and that's what we did i, I want to take I, i'd like to take credit for the design of the 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 kind of really slick bars but it's actually it comes from would you believe it the orange county chopper days of uh i had to go <laughs> i remember seeing something for, it was from a biker build do you remember the biker build offs they used to have do you remember them yeah. So, growing up with it. do you remember? Do you remember a brand called Exile Cycles? Oh yeah, of course. Russell Mitchell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so he, his. I don't know if you remember his style, but it was basically completely stripped back, paired back. There was no control. There was no no levers. No on on a lot of his stuff. There's no levers. No. It was the bare minimum. Everything was really. And I used to love that style, but he was always really big, chunky Harleys, which I was never that overly keen on. But I liked the idea of it. And I, and I remember he ran a similar setup like this on one of his other bikes. Um, and uh, and I, I pretty much I thought you know what I haven't seen that for about ten years and no one's I think it never really left the Harley scene so I, I investigated into it and I managed to 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 work out a system um, uh, I can't remember exactly it's like a 
a helical. Um, uh, it, it, you basically, when you twist it, it draw it, it draws up this um, uh, sleeve, and the sleeve is attached to the cable, and therefore you have obviously your throttle on one side, and the cable runs through the centre of the tube. That's your throttle side, and then on the other side. It's the same, but that runs to a um, your your clutch and the way in which the spiral or the depth uh, of rate at which the spiral is cut depends on the kind of leverage you need. So obviously on the clutch one, you need a little bit more leverage, so it's cut differently. Um, but it it, it it rides lovely. I mean, well, you've ridden it, haven't you? Have you ridden it? Yeah, I we were uh, we rode it together for the um, oil in the blood uh, filming, and it it definitely took a little getting used to. I won't lie. <laughs> during that first lap, but I'm really, I'm really glad it was on a closed course track because if I had like yeah. traffic coming at me right at that point, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure it would have gone yeah. very well. It's the whole coordination it, of what... twisting. Yeah, is, yeah, uh, but it's what... used to, once you're used to it. Uh, exactly. That's that's the best way to put it. You get used to it, and we found that. I mean, we'll get we'll get onto it. You know, when you start seeing Jake ride it, he said the same thing. He was like, he was absolutely, you know, bricking it when he had having to ride it round on the track, <laughs> and then he get on it, and and after about half an hour's riding, he's like, I, I could do this all day. This is no problem. Yeah. Um, but it's but yeah, so, so I mean, that, that... Try to ride on something else in a normal fashion that doesn't go so well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Between them. yeah. Yeah, yeah, you got to stay on one or the other. Um, but um, but yeah, no, yeah. It, it was basically it means that we could just keep them really slick in it. And we, I, I got a lot of stick from a lot of friends regarding the design of the handlebars because they said it looks like one of those little kiddies trikes, you know, the little ones where you have <laughs> the little bars, little handlebars, but which it does a little bit. But I, I just wanted the simplest possible and most comfortable solution to mounting them mm. uh, to, to the bar design. And that was simply it um so so that that yeah. tidied all that side of things up and then the braking side of things because everyone oh, there you go um so the um the braking side of things um w was remedied with a um a basically a, a by oh what's it called um it's a bias braking valve so basically that that the the front the rear brake does both front and back and that little dial there dials in how much front to back that you've got so you know, we won't lie. We we did um, uh, we did I say reduce its 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 overall braking uh, sort of performance by a bit. But actually, again, once you got used to it and you dialed that in, you could you could brake pretty much like you would do normally, just off the rear pedal, um, which worked really well. Brilliant. And then for getting the bike going, also a similar approach. I mean, obviously you've removed all the yeah. switch cubes and everything, so. Where do you put the starter? Yeah, yeah, well, Obviously, right in the headstock. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. I mean, how did you even package that in there? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, the <laughs> uh, so basically, <laughs> yeah, um, the uh, we basically ended up, if I recollect correctly, uh, we drilled out um the one the the um the locking nut on the top. I think, and then basically that's threaded into the top, and then the wires go all the way through the hollow stem, and then out the bottom, and then with enough, obviously, uh, enough uh, free play for you to be able to turn. Um, but how that worked? That was inspired from oh, that film. What's it called? Fast and Furious. That was that. Yeah, um, oh, that had great. a go. Yeah. Eleanor, Eleanor the Mustang had a go, baby, go button. So I decided that's what this needed. Um, and um, an amazing amount of American inspiration here for for a British builder. I mean, it's very flattering, of course. But, you know. I didn't realize it until actually talking about it. Yeah, basically, there's nothing British about it at all. I'm, I need to be called Old United States Empire or something like that. Uh, but they had, oh, um, uh, but but we had uh, the wiring that goes back to that point we talked about earlier about how simple the wiring was. So, for instance, on I reckon 99% of most motorcycles of, you know, uh, 2000 and sort of 15, 16 onwards, um, if I removed an indicator, you, you know, the bike screams and doesn't know what to do and you have to take it and be reprogrammed and all that stuff. Um, what I found with the, with, with the Interceptor was you could literally remove everything you wanted to and it would still run um uh and so you could yeah you know, we could we if per, as from a for, from a customizing perspe uh, perspective it was fantastic you know it enabled us to do so much more without worrying about it not being able to actually 
run. So we, we simply paired the wiring down to a motor, motor gadget um, immobile, uh, oh, what's it called, keyless ignition. So on the side of the one of the panels, you just waved a fob uh, or a little trend, uh, transponder, which was sewn into one of the gloves. And you wave that over it. The light around that Go Baby Go button would light up because there was a solenoid which would click the ignition in and then that meant you could press it and then that would start the the, the, the engine yeah brilliantly simple i mean it's, it's very cool to hear that that feedback that um it was easy to to take apart easy to to work on and, and obviously um it's something that we spent a lot of time in development uh trying to maintain um you talked about your your first builds being um very much like they were bikes from the the 50s or 60s uh, and we try to keep that level of simplicity. So, I mean, it's really, really, really nice to hear that um, that is, in fact, in fact, useful to you. Yeah, no, it was handy. Okay, moving around the engine a little bit. Um, I remember you had a, a sort of a different treatment for the engine covers. I thought this was kind of neat because, you know, most of the time we'll do powder coating or um, or just wet painting, you know, using a two-pack paint or something on the engine covers. But you went with uh, Cerakote. Uh, uh, finish on there is there any reason for that choice or you know something that you know obviously people could be interested in doing to their own motors mm. yeah i mean i think it's becoming a more and more popular alternative to painting and powder coat if i'm honest uh, honest um so i mean we're, we're we're very friendly with the um the the uk cerakote uk um and um they're one of the biggest um sort of suppliers you know sort of in europe um bringing it in from the states um uh, and they provide um a service in which we can that we can hand them anything that's been either coated prior to that um so whether powder coated or painted they'll blast it prep it and then basically it's a, a very very thin coating that's baked on and it's and it's it's incredibly durable but also very uh, it's temper temperature temperature resistant as well uh, and you can get various different specs of it high temp stuff low temp stuff all that sort of stuff but it's um the 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 actual finish of it you can get satin glass all that and i i really like the kind of satiny look of the black cerakote it's, it's called armor black i, I believe um and mm. we decided to take all the casings off and then obviously get all of the insets um with uh, with gold it's either gold leaf or gold, something i can't remember exactly but it was it was basically inlaid all of the the writing which we really liked was quite really classic looking with the uh, with the gold um yeah it, it works really well and i like the contrast of it too i mean the cerakote works really nicely we i mean a lot of our earlier builds we used to get everything powder coat and powder coat is great for hiding up stuff so if you especially on an older frame or a or you you know got a bit of dodgy fabrication, then you can use up you can use powder coat to hide a lot of stuff. Same with paint. With Cerakote, it has to be a very very good finish in the first place to be able to mm. to, to to cover. Um, and um, you know, so I think it almost shows the fact that if you're using Cerakote, you can't really hide stuff either. So no cheating with that. I mean, no speaking cheating. of the yeah. speaking of uh, the gold details and and just the really beautiful yet simple finishes that you've gone for. Um, yeah. Again, on the, the on the logo here, we've got the gold. Obviously, you're, you talked about earlier about the um, replacing the filler cap with a, a flush unit. Um, yeah. The paint itself, and it's very hard to see in, in photos. You really have to have the bike in the sun. But I remember that's one of the things that stood out for us when, when we first saw the bike was this very subtle flip in red uh, red to black um, that, yeah. that happened on the happened in particular on the tank. Uh, and also on the um, the sort of headlamp or front area. Headlamp shroud, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yeah, no. I mean, I, I get. I think this whole bike, you know, an element of this build is like, like I said, I had no real idea where we were headed ultimately with it until we got to that point. Um, within reason, we had a vague idea, like I said, but the build as it went kind of dictated, you know, what what we thought would suit it. And I think as we were going along, we were kind of draping bits of um material over it we were we had color charts we were coloring bits and bobs on it and one of the things that we said we really liked um with the um i can't what where did we pick out the color from it might have been the red of the light on the go baby go i can't remember why red came into it but it did and we said well i don't want it racing red we don't want all that we wanted something really subtle i mean a lot of our builds we don't go for bright and bling we go for very 
deep dark like luscious color so like if i if we do a blue bike it'll be like a really deep blue almost looking black and same for green we've done a green i don't know if we've done a red we've done the typhoon but that was more of a mottled color but this one we went with this really deep metallic base color uh, i think that's flying tiger paintworks um helped us out with that and basically unless you see it in the flesh i mean it's so difficult on the photos to tell actually there is this really deep red like like a ruby color underneath there um and i really like that because the whole you know the whole thing was kind of i wanted to keep it fairly understated you know in some in some ways yeah there's a real elegance to it when when put next to the the gold details as well um like yeah. just I mean, sort of like the the way you treated the handlebars and everything. There's a real sort of refinement to it um, that, that mm, comes out. Mm, mm. There you go. There's the red. And That's now, maybe where we got the red from. Yeah. There's your red, indeed. A nice little quilting detail on the seat. I recall that the seat material, at least the top material, is a little bit unusual. It is. Yeah. It's um. Well, actually, in fact, both bits of material are, are, are unusual in their own respect. So the the leather so the smoother the smoother red around the side and um, we managed to get that from because we, we do a lot of or we did a lot of leather work um with a lot of the panels and other bits and bobs on a lot of our other bikes and so we had a really good contact for people who had um uh, a stock of sort of weird and wonderful bits and bobs and i found this stuff off of a a guy that basically he reupholsters old uh, bugattis and this was the a particular it was we didn't have a lot of it because it was very expensive and 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 he 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 didn't really allow any other people to use it because he didn't want people doing what he did but because we're doing what we did he was happy to let it go and um and yeah so that's actually used to reupholster like vintage bugattis um and then the 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 suede bit on top is actually um a dog bed material so a lot of people go oh Christ, i wouldn't put suede on you know on a seat or anything that's going to be exposed to the elements but this it, it looks just like suede feels just like suede fully synthetic but it repels all the water um and like smell and and all that lot so yeah we thought it, it, if it's good enough for a dog's bed it's probably good enough for what we want to use it for so you've combined the leather from a Bugatti with yeah. a material a used dog. for dog beds. Correct. Like we couldn't think of a better combination. Right yeah. We couldn't think of a better combination, so we went with it. Good man. <laughs> talking a little bit about <laughs> talking about your your process and uh, and sort of your your heavy usage of masking tape and so on. Uh, we've got a couple of shots here of. Um, of the bike, you know, before before it got all these um, luscious materials and paints and so on attached to it. Um, it's not, it's not much masking. Yeah, this one is pretty uh, masking tape free. I think I've got another one a little bit later with a bit more tape on it. I think maybe you didn't want around. me to know how much masking tape was involved. So, <laughs> you know, this is like a masking tape free yeah. image. Yeah. Um, the uh, yes, I mean one of the first things that we do is we 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 sort the stance. Uh, well, I, well, in fact, the process pretty simply is we get the bike in, we try it out, we see what we like about it, we don't like about it in terms of its functionality and what we want to keep, what we don't want to keep. Then we uh, will strip it right down to its barest essentials. You know, chucking everything we absolutely know we don't want, um, and then we work on the stance, and that's basically usually concerns either changing the wheels um out entirely uh changing the tires uh, or and or changing the tires uh playing around with the suspension and just generally mocking stuff up moving the tank about moving things about so we get that stance right this kind of the, the lines right um and um i think if i remember rightly with this build we actually were really happy because we were considering relacing the wheels um and in the end we um we managed to find the perfect set of tires which were almost slicks um which was what i wanted because we weren't going to go down this really sporty route but i thought it would be quite a cool contrast to have something that wasn't quite a sport you know, di you know we didn't have a fairing and all that lot but almost looked like it could be taken around the track on the basis of the tires it had so we went we met i think there was Walt Max, I can't remember exactly the top made what they're done a lot. I think they were done a lot. But anyway, they were they were, they were cool looking tires. And um, once we got those proportions sorted, we then really started to build up a, an idea of the rest of it. 
Jason, so how much work do you, I mean, you talk a little bit about working with suppliers and, and um, doing some work in house. What, what's the percentage there? How much are you looking at these days as in, in your, in your evolved process as you've gone along? Um, you still do most uh, of it uh, in house. I've seen you there with a the welding torch and so on. And, um, yeah, that's just for that's just for show. Um, the um, <laughs> we we do. Uh, I don't I don't know how to, I don't I don't know how to weld. That's ridiculous. Um, uh, the I, I think we used to like back uh, the first few bikes that we done or most of mo most of them we would have you know we'd do most of the fab the heavy fabrication sheet metal work a lot of the heavy machining we got outsourced to um, like Domina Customs they did a lot of our. CNC work um, because that's what they specialize in. I, I found out quite quickly as much as I'd like to be able to do everything. And I think, you know, without being big headed, I think I could probably manage most things, but there's a level at which you can do something because you, that's what you've done for a long time, you know, in terms of a, a level of quality. You know, I think most people, if they have a stab at something, can do it. And then it's, you know, but then it's then being able to do it well enough to, for it to complement yeah. everything else on what you're building. Yeah. So, I mean, um, so, you know, I think our first builds, we we probably did most of it, every, almost all of it ourselves. And then gradually, as we've, as we've gone along, I think we've I've wanted to put out a, 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 I don't know, a better quality bike, I guess. And to do that, I've needed to use other people's, you know, better skill sets to, to do that. So I think at the moment, I mean... Um, we're actually using a, a, a fabrication firm called Signature Fabrication, who is one of the best fabricators I've ever I've ever seen, and they do a lot of our fabrication now as well. So I'm almost there, just in a design role now, if I'm honest. Um, I, I, we do the odd one or two, you know, here when you know um, if the right one comes up. But you know, unlike your build on this build, for instance. Um, you know, I, I think it was probably one of the last ones which we did majority of the the work on, aside from you know the painting and some of the heavy machining. Well, we're honored to have been uh, been part of that. So, for us, another very interesting part of this build, and that one of the other things that, that helped set it apart, apart from, of course, all the all the fun uh, approach you've taken to the the handlebars and, and the paint and so on, um, is how the bike is has become a bit of a character in and of itself it's sort of um as we went into the talking about how to make a, a video about this um we remembered some of your past videos uh having a very fun and playful air and and because of that we didn't want to do just another you know build video with some sparks flying and you know some some welding masks and so on um, I want we to wanted do something that really, what's that <laughs> I said I wanted to do that, but you didn't. <laughs> Fair enough. You you seem to have done an amazing job of that. And we got these pictures of you, you know, fake welding or whatever you were doing uh, as well. So. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yeah. In an awkward position there. Um, but so we got this we got this video going, um, and I remember we were talking with yourself and and your your partner Rafe there at uh, Old Empire Productions uh, about how we could do something in that vein um and you know of course partnering with uh with head on for a unique helmet to to match to the build and everything um it really became something in its own in its own right um let's flip to another picture here of it and the flight of the interceptor can you tell us a little bit about the the inspirations behind that i mean obviously it's it's almost cinematic in its in its level yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, to be honest, um, Rafe, my business partner with Old Empire, um, he would be better to um, to run for a few the the details. I, like I said, I'm, I'm more to do with the, the bike building side of things, um, but he's, he's busy with uh, uh, filmmaking and directing at the moment. But he he um, he had an idea uh, based around I think it's Cool Hand Luke, uh, the film, um, and uh, and it, like, about this and kind of. One of the venue, one of the locations that we've shot or shot at prior to this is at um, uh, Bent. Oh, where is it? Bent um, Bentwaters, RAF Bentwaters. That was it. An old Cold War um, uh, airfield, and um, they used to. And I remember when we were there uh, from a prior shoot, they had all these old like nuclear bunkers and stuff. I'm going, wow, that would make a really cool like with fencing and towers and all sorts of like, oh, man, a great place to shoot. And then Ray and Rafe was developing this idea, I think, alongside you of wanting to move it away from this 
I think a little bit. Um, I don't know the whole. As much as I like uh, angle grinders and sparks, which I do, um, it's uh, it could become I think a bit old. And um, so you know, we wanted this this kind of real fresh take, almost a bit kind of tongue in cheek um, look. You know, um, uh, uh, way of showcasing this new build. And also, we wanted to make sure people. You know, all those the naysayers that went, yeah, that's just a show pony. You never ride that. Da, da, da. It's like because we always get it when we, you know, and we have had bikes that were show ponies, but we we built this one not to be, and um, and that's why it was important to have that space to be able to run it around and really, you know, and really get uh, you know, get get as much out of the bike as we could, and that's why we got Jake, um, Jake Young involved as well. He's got years of experience um uh modeling and uh racing um off-road and on-road motorcycles and so we, if we knew anybody was going to be able to get the most out of it he would there we are see it certainly looks like we could get the most out of it i mean if there's any doubt and we got a bunch of questions online as well as about you know with that handlebar setup and the braking setup and everything um is this actually rideable i mean one of we go to shows and some people you can you can hear them talking amongst themselves very knowingly mm-hmm. saying you know well that's that's it's just a show bike you can't you can't ride that there's no levers or anything on it clearly mm-hmm. uh not so much an issue absolutely really yeah i mean well yeah. yeah yeah no absolutely and and, and um you know, like when you when you took it round the track after you know when we were shooting for oil in the blood, that was my first. Although I had ridden it round for that shoe, that was mostly um, Jake. Um, but we when we um, when we were shooting on that on your bit of it, on it, I I just I couldn't believe how well it handled. I couldn't believe how well it went. And like you and like you said, after a little you know 10, 15 minutes of riding with that setup, I was it was. I could ride that. I felt like I was riding fast. I probably didn't look like I was riding fast, but you know, it was, <laughs> it was, it was, um, and it sounded like it was going fast, but it's, you know, I, I think, um, yeah, we did, we did, I mean, all building, all building custom, anything, whether it's a motorcycle car, whatever you're making, there's always a balance between form and function. And it's finding that, that middle point or whether you're going to swing more in form or more in function. Um, you know, you, you're always going to have a compromise there um, if you're going to you're trying to make it look the way you want to make it look. And I felt like we had quite a decent compromise between the way in which it looked and the way in which it rode. You definitely attest to that. And I'm really happy you got out there and uh, showed that it was actually safe to ride before I did. So that, that was really important, mm-hmm. you know, part of the process. I, I don't think I said so it. Off, fine. I don't recollect actually having a choice, but uh, I think... <laughs> I think it was like it was like you, it's like you're going to take it out and then we'll see where you get on and then it'll be that okay that's good oh, fun though yeah, enjoy yeah <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah well, no one time <laughs> I think I think that is a fantastic uh, note to end on um, yeah. thank you so much for joining us um, it, it, I'm so so happy to have, continue the uh, American British special relationship. And now that I know, that, of course, uh, your your strong influences uh, from my from my home Amazing. country. Um, <laughs> even Absolutely, so, yeah. No, uh, a- everybody else, uh, please stay around. We've got a, a special showing of the flight of the interceptor here uh, for your viewing pleasure, and come back next week. Um, as we talk with Bulleteer Customs about their hooligan build. Until then. Cause I am a motherless
this child alone. I am a godless child. Say the Lord don't like sinners And the world don't like me So I'll keep on singing Cause it's hard to be free Cause I am a marvelous child, Lord Say I am a godless child